Learning is a constant process of discovery, a process without end. These very apt words were quoted by Bruce Lee. Clearly, he never stopped learning, kept reinventing himself, and that's what led him to achieving mastery. A very good morning and a warm welcome to all. ET presents the CLO Roundtable in association with LinkedIn Talent Solutions. I'm your host, Deepti Diwan, and on behalf of ET Edge, I welcome you to this discussion on the transformation of L&D, how to set up for success. Well, before we kickstart the proceedings, let me inform you of what's in store for this roundtable. Well, you can look forward to hearing from experts and leaders from the industry. And through the conversation, you get the opportunity to put forth your questions to our speakers. Yes, we do have a dedicated Q&A session towards the end of the discussion. So make sure to send in your questions. You may type your questions in the chat box or you may raise your hand and speak during the Q&A. We also have a quick fun poll towards the end, which will take just a few seconds. So do take the poll and share your thoughts with us. Requesting all participants to kindly keep themselves on mute so that we can enjoy a seamless conversation. So before we kickstart this roundtable, let me set the context for you. We know that in the current scenario, most companies are embracing hybrid work models and revising workplace policies. In the meantime, learning and development or L&D has gained all the attention of executives and become an even more powerful function with greater goals. According to the 2022 Workplace Learning Report by LinkedIn, L&D is not only busy building a culture of learning, but is also responsible for future-proofing their organization. It requires L&D professionals to invest in their skills too. At the same time, 70% of L&D professionals in India are expecting their spending power to increase in 2022 giving them an opportunity to invest in talent development, technology, and their own skills. Thus, gradually, l and is taking the center stage to help employees develop new skills and gain knowledge that will eventually lead to growth of business. However, all this is spurring new pressure to deliver results too. There are greater challenges ahead of chief learning officers or CLOs and l and leaders. So gear up for this round table where some of the most successful CLOs will share their best practices to help you set up for success. And uh, we do have a power packed panel with us today. We have some eminent leaders and I'm delighted to welcome all of them. A warm welcome to Anuradha Bharat. Anuradha is the vice president of the people operations function at Razorpay Software Private Limited, a dynamic and creative HR Anuradha comes with a wide ranging experience at high profile organizations like VMware, Symphony, and many more across varied industries. We welcome Anurag Seth, Vice President and Head, Talent Transformation at Wipro. Anurag is an expert in taking ideas, products, and services from incubation to significant scale up. He has worked with multicultural teams across USA, Canada, UK, Europe. Japan and APAC, and has gained significant experience presenting at both board and executive levels. Welcome Dr. C. Jay Kumar, Executive Vice President and Head, Corporate Human Resources, l and Limited. Dr. Jay Kumar is a highly result-oriented HR professional with 33 years of experience in successfully planning, designing, implementing, and managing various strategic HR initiatives. He has been an established thought leader and widely acclaimed speaker in various national and international conferences and forums. We welcome Imani Pereira, Head of Learning and Development, John Keels Group. John Keels is one of Sri Lanka's largest listed conglomerates formulating people development strategies and learning solutions for its diverse businesses. Imani has worked in HR, marketing and management consulting in multiple sectors, ranging from manufacturing to leisure, financial services to information technology. We have with us Nikita Panchal, 
Vice President and Global Head, Talent, OD and DNI ACG World. Nikita is an executive coach and a global leader with a HR experience of over 19 years. She has worked with reputed organizations like Tata Asset Management, Motilal Oswal Securities, etc. She considers herself as an agent of transformation, and it thrills her to constantly push the edge of consciousness in herself and in others. And to moderate this session, we have with us Samir Ogarwal. He's India Head Learning and Engagement LinkedIn. Samir started his career as a dot-com entrepreneur while in college, selling email as a service and building websites. He has a diverse set of skills in technology, operations, and sales. He has been with LinkedIn for eight years. As head of LinkedIn Learning and Glint, he works with organizations across India to build robust employee development, internal mobility, and employee culture programs, leveraging the tools, data, and insights available from LinkedIn. Samir is also the country lead for the Wisdom Employee Resource Group that aims to create a workplace where everyone can succeed regardless of age. Well, with that, I now promptly hand over to Samir to steer this session forward. Over to you, Samir. Thank you so much for kicking this off, Deepi. And it's such an absolute pleasure and privilege to be on this panel today. I'm looking forward to a great deal of learning uh, from all of you, all, all of the panelists. And very good context setting as well, Deepthi. So you're so right. LND as a function has become extremely mission critical over the past two years. And the success of this function really is the success of a business. Uh, today, LND leaders are being asked to play a highly strategic and forward looking role, which is even beyond identifying and solving skill gaps. Now, as per our recent research, 84% of LD professionals agree that LD has become a more strategic function within their organizations. In fact, 91% have already helped their organizations adapt to change. No wonder that LD as a function is completely transformed today. Like you said, Deepthi, it's exciting, but at the same time, challenging. How can LD professionals be set up for success amidst all these changes? We'll discuss all of this today and hear about the key success mantras from these industry experts who really are the most iconic voices in their field. So welcome again, panel. Let's get started. I'll start with my first question, which really is about this buzz word of transformation and everything that's happening around us. Uh, what are some of the trends uh, that you guys are seeing? You know, what is getting discussed in the boardrooms? Uh, Anuradha, perhaps I'll start with you because you're on the left of my screen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, very privileged to be here and uh, to be able to share uh, my views amongst amongst all of you. And thanks for the lovely introduction, uh, all of you. Um, till now, uh, people were looking for jobs. Now jobs are looking for people. I think that's the biggest change that has happened in uh, in the industry today. The dynamics of, uh, of the job space is changing and it's changing nearly every year these days. Remote work is no longer specifically uh, being a freelancer's job. People today demand flexibility more than ever. The, the blurring boundaries of employment in these setups, I think that is forcing us to think differently about human capital, about, uh, about the talent landscape itself. Traditional workforce management principles and frameworks, I am not sure we're designed for, for these setups anymore because you know it's evolving, it's changing uh, day by day. And slowly, I think there are, there are new things that are emerging. People have begun to think a lot more on their feet, reinventing the way they look at human capital itself. I think this changing landscape also means that people truly want to derive value from every program that is being delivered, every program that is being designed. And people today, um, the influencers uh, in our workspace have become, have become our managers, they've become our, our peers, and this leads a lot of respect to peers. So when there is this, this respect that has already been established amongst our peers, 
to me, how do I make this mutual respect that is there for, for peers? How do I make this work in a learning scenario? I think that is one of my, one of my key agenda today um, in, in the learning space specifically, right? Peer to peer on the job learning is I think one of the top trends that we are going to see uh, becoming much stronger uh, in the in the system today, because you work for organizations which are which are growing at breakneck speed. You work for organizations where somehow you are always behind the curve because the organization is growing at a much faster pace. So on the job, peer to peer learning is is to me the top trend. I think the second is how do we customize learning to suit individual needs the pace, the flexibility of time, and also the hybrid solutions that, that we need to give people. And I think the other biggest thing that I, that I see emerging in, um, in the LND space and what will truly bring meaning and value to people is, is purpose. I think uh, there are a lot of multidimensional facets today like social impact, purpose, and a large philosophical angle to, uh, to one's job needs and today's job scenario today. So bringing a purpose that aligns with one's larger goals uh, is also going to take a large precedence to what has so far been uh, the trends. Fantastic, you know, love this peer-to-peer -peer learning, personalization, really aligning uh, to purpose. And I loved how you started where you said that uh, today, people are not looking for jobs. Jobs are looking for people, and therefore, uh, the LND programs that you drive also have to support that. Uh, Dr. Jay Kumar, let me come to you now. Uh, what What would you say? Uh, so you're on mute. Thank you, Samir um, and the deep uh, and rather uh, you briefly touched upon major areas. Thanks for being. Uh, thanks for inviting me for this panel discussion. Looking at the three broad uh, areas, I can bucket into the changing scenario into three broad areas. One is the environment. Second is the learning preferences of people. And the third is how the whole training delivery is happening. This, all the three has gone into a major change. Let me brief one by one. Taking it to environment, there's a double disruption. One side, the COVID was created a lot of disruption. Another is the technology, which World Economic Forum, the report very clearly says that 85 million jobs will get eliminated by 2025. 90 some new types of jobs will emerge and the net net there are 12 million new jobs available worldwide. Um, there are many things, if you look at what are the jobs like data entry, accounting, uh, some amount of uh, the, the assembly work, um, uh, many mechanical routine operational works may get vanished and you may get new jobs like data analyst, um, AI, ML, technology based process automation, such things will, will emerge. Even in a core um, um, brick and mortar industry like EPC and manufacturing, which we are in, Lot of transformation is happening because of AI, ML, IoT, cloud computing, digital supply chain, all those things are happening. So this all require new amount of technical skills in required. In addition, there's also need for certain behavior skills like critical thinking, analysis, um, um, problem solving, etc. So the so we have to the organization has to catch up to this. Second area out I said is the learning preferences are changing. Uh, the because there's a different demographic uh, aging of people are there. There is workforce, there are millennials till that gen is that there are different types of people are there. And due to lack of time, now the more effort is on on the go learning, mobile devices. So the learning has become very, very purposive. What he said, you know, the, um, uh, she was talking about peer-to-peer -peer learning, on the job, customizing to the individual. All those so it has become purposive, it is adaptive, it is skill-based, it is continuous, bite-sized, micro-learning, uh, and a lot of gamification, etc. It is happening. This is the second trend. Third, the delivery has changed. Earlier, it was a classroom calling them, doing a training. Then it became digital and totally digital during the COVID. And now it has become a blended learning approach. So it is education-based, exposure-based, reflection-based. 
there is um, uh, online learning, virtual VILT, virtual instructor-led training. So different types of, so to sum up, environment is changing, learning preferences are changing and the learning delivery is changing. These are the major trends which I am seeing in the broad area of learning and learning. Love it. And thanks for that. And thank you for summing it up as well. Nikita, let's move to you. What are your thoughts? Yeah, thanks for that, Samir. And you know, I feel at the moment, like, like when we used to answer this question and say all of the above and tick that box and say, yes, all of the above, that's, that's the feeling I'm getting right now. And completely echo the points mentioned by Anuradha and uh, Dr. Jay Kumar. I just like to add in two new things that uh, I've experienced at ACG. Uh, one is, you know, uh, I like uh, Jay Kumar what you spoke about blended learning uh, and a lot of attention goes towards skill building, understanding skill gaps, looking at, you know, transformative ways of designing programs which could help people. But I'm seeing that the world is moving away from program-based learning to looking at learning in an exponential way. So we've in fact uh, been discussing about uh, what would it be to learn if we weren't to design a program. And uh, you know, as l and professionals, we are so conditioned that every learning needs to happen through a very well-structured design program offering. It has to be either an e-learning, it has to either be a classroom learning, and if nothing else, it has to be an online learning of any form. And here's a world that's inviting us and telling us that learning is happening in every moment. As you're listening to comments here, learning is happening. As you're reading an article, learning is happening. As you're handling a project, learning is happening. As you're shadowing a person in their boardroom, learning is happening. And how do you really redefine the word learning and really make it exponential enough to say that you are learning in the moment wherever you are placed and wherever you're placed is the right place for you to learn. So one of the philosophy that we've been driving in the organization is to say that you are learning all the time. You decide what's your mechanism that suits you best. And you do not go by the conventional route to only learn in one particular way. And this new definition has come also because you know, of the ways of working in the last few years that we have experienced, where people have taken up learnings which were very, very different, diverse than what they were earlier used to or what they were earlier offered by an organization. The second thing that I'm becoming aware of is, you know, the entire linearity of learning has changed. So we used to earlier learn because we needed a job. We used to take that education that you require to take up a job. You would build a skill to get the next promotion. You would take up a, a, a learning program because you want to handle the next best project in hand. But here people are talking about learning, baking to handle the skills of uh, maybe you know uh, some action in the team which they want to do differently or learning to uh, have more mindfulness in order to handle the leadership quality better or doing a forest bathing exercise so that you build up more empathy in the way you deal with the next person in the boardroom. And I think the entire linearity of skill to learning is getting challenged to saying, what do I need to really learn? And it's not necessarily that it's going to be provided by a, 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 a classroom program, or it's not necessarily that it's going to be provided by a teacher-led learning or a facilitator-led learning. It could just be a very deep immersive experience, which could just shift the way you think, you act, you perform in the organization. And more and more people are becoming open to those exponential opportunities, which in fact takes away the pressure from all of us in this room to design learning, because you don't need to design learning, you need to design the environment, which helps the people to pick up what they wish to learn. And I feel that's the future of learning. Wow, those were some powerful nuggets, really, really well said. And, you know, uh, to summarize what I picked up, the first thing you said was learning in the moment, anywhere and everywhere, right? That's how I kind of put it. Fantastic. And I also loved it when you said that uh, learning today is also about being more effective with what you're doing and not just about, uh, you know, finding a new job, for example, and therefore really challenging the linearity between skills and learning. So very well said. Anurag, uh, let me come to you now. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, just building on that uh, uh, thing, you know, when you talk about learning, you know, just before the pandemic, you know, we had all these swanky 
classrooms. In fact, we had gone ahead and built an entire new learning center, which still I have to cut the ribbon, you know, because I don't know, there is nobody there inside that uh, learning center. And, and it, the biggest thing is that uh, people used to always love that, you know, let me leave my work, come sit in a classroom, attend the training, understand. And now they have to do it sitting at home uh, where, you know, many of the people said that peer-to-peer -peer learning, when you used to learn a lot of things on the corridors, this is that the corridor is missing. That is a big uh, ticket item right now. And, you know, when, when we actually opened the offices and even now we said, you know, it's all optional for people to come you realize the number of people coming is very low, very, very low. You know, people are get, got so comfortable working remotely. Now, in given this context, how do you engage the people into the learning? You know, you can still do a virtual uh, training session through, you know, through a virtual instructor-led training. You can still do some assessment, uh, uh, you know, uh, and all. But how do you engage people and how do they learn from mentors, from peer-to-peer -peer is the big thing. Second thing is that we have realized that there is no way you can have a nine hour session, uh, you know, by a faculty, even if it is virtual, you know, or even if it's four or five hours, people just don't want to do it. They're saying, okay, give me the material. I will learn my, myself, right? So there's the concept of learning paths have started coming in that, okay, you tell me what I should learn, right? And that is where uh, the thing is that we have created these learning paths. Okay, go ahead, do this e-learning. Yes, you need mentors. So we will give you mentor connects that will happen. Yes, you need a lot of hands-on. So we will give you virtual labs. We will give you uh, those hands-on assignments, real life projects, so that you engage on your own. And then mentors also come on the same page. If you want, you ask a question. Right now, how do you balance between an instructor-led session versus um, you know, self-learning versus hands-on? I think that is the whole gamut that you know all of us have struggled with right now. And, and at this point of time, uh, you know, our trainings, uh, I being in Wipro IT, so, you know, our trainings are designed in such a way where uh, every single program, which could be anything between 40 hours to 120 hours of a program is designed in such a way where you have some e-learning, you have mentor sessions, you have some faculty sessions where you talk about some niche, niche point or niche scale or something like that. And more importantly, you have given them enough amount of virtual labs and a lot of hands-on assignments to play with. And not only that, give them capstone projects, we call it, which is like mini projects you give them so that at the end of the learning, you know, ultimately the person has to be deployed on a customer project and then you get ready for a customer project, right? That is one. The other big thing that we said was, you know, in a services, IT services industry, you know, many customers, they don't want trained people. They want people who have experience. And even if you give hands-on, it's probably not good enough at times. You know, they said you work on real-life projects. And now, so we, we actually went ahead and put up a, uh, we had a crowdsourcing platform where you put pieces of live projects on the platform, which any employee anywhere, anywhere in the world can pick up that piece of work and do it. Now, why will they do that piece of work? If you just tell the person, you know, you, you do this piece of work because you need to get live experience on a new technology or a skill. You know, while it may sound motivational, not a single person will do it beyond their regular work hours and uh, do this activity, right? So the whole principle of a crowdsourcing is that, you know, if you put that two, three hours extra on a weekday or some time on a weekend, you actually get paid money. So for every challenge that we put, we, there is a money tag attached to it. You know, it could be $100, $300, $1,000, depending on the complexity of that module. And uh, if it is very easy, where there's a large number of skills available, maybe the prize money can be a small money. But wherever you find there's a very niche skill, uh, and for that niche skill, the number of people available is low, you put a high price money. We have made it like a marketplace. So now we tell people, you have everything available. Uh, you have all e-learning content, you have all assessments, you have all uh, hands-on assignments, you have a real life project, which has money attached to it. Now you go ahead and you know swim in the water. And then, yes, by the way, I have also got my faculty as mentors who will be available every day, Monday to Friday, some time slots you give them whom you can ask. Now that's the self-learning culture that one, you know, we've tried to create, which is a completely new paradigm. You know, we, we, we were only thinking about it pre-pandemic, but post-pandemic, it has suddenly happened as if, you know, we, we just didn't need to put so much effort, which we were struggling to do pre-pandemic. And the question was that what has changed between them and now is this culture of uh, learning, culture of self-learning and uh, things like that. We still have, by the way, all the faculties which we have, but the roles of the faculties have changed from being a teacher to a mentor, you know, and that really is a transition that has taken place. So I'll take a pause here. 
No, that's fantastic and a great uh, way to kind of end your piece, your, the movement of faculties. Uh, so from being faculties or teachers to mentors and uh, love the way you're driving the self-learning culture. Uh, would definitely love to understand a bit more around uh, how you're facilitating those corridor conversations that you spoke about. Uh, but before that, let me move to Imani. Imani, your thoughts on the religious trends. Thank you. And it's lovely hearing everyone's thoughts and being here with the rest of the panel this morning. Uh, so I think uh, the, the, the fortunate task of being the last to speak on something that was, uh, you know, collective in terms of expression to everyone is that you can all you you've you've actually paid heed to all the learning that uh, has been passed out before you. So I think the personalized learning that Anuradha spoke on, uh, the environment that Jay Kumar touched on, uh, the learning in the flow of work that Nikita uh, spelt out, and the technology that has, you know, created a massive impact uh, is what Anuradha alluded to, besides a lot of other things. Uh, so rather than repeating or, or sort of uh, reiterating things, whilst I completely agree with everything that has been said, and I do see that that some things like learning learning in the flow of work are things that have been uh, very much invest, uh, in, in, you know, embedded now at, in, in, in terms of work cultures. I think one of the things uh, that I find uh, is trending as well as uh, impact, being very impactful over the last two years, especially, is the connectedness that we have, the connectivity that everyone has worked out. Because, I mean, uh, a forum like this, for example, uh, po possibly had been in some play form or shape being there before, but uh, the the sort of uh, how how the proximity it has brought us to now is I think far more than what it has been in the past years and this just took a black swan moment of the pandemic to hit us to realize that it, it is it is possible it's not like we invented the technology yesterday it has been there with us but it's just that need caused us to really put it into place and um, also, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, bring it into the here and the now. And I think that has been very powerful and has really transformed uh, ways in which people work, how people work and how people uh, connect and, uh, you know, uh, unite together. So I think that has been something that has been phenomenal. And the, the other side to that is when you when you get people connected and you have the conversations that you're walk, you're speaking around is also been very robust. And I think from things like technology to mindfulness to various things, the hybrid work cultures, things that we have, you know, probably passingly spoken at like Anurag said, at various in various corridors, for example, or at uh, you know, uh, our sort of water breaks, we have brought into the forum now we have brought into mainstream and that has uh, you know the fact that we are asking about these questions bringing it out to the open is something that has made a huge difference and i feel that uh, the the conversations and the connectedness is something that i really felt feel is the way forward fantastic the conversations and the connectedness absolutely and uh you know, one of the common themes from uh, what everyone said is really how these skills are also changing quite a bit and everything that we're doing, you know, uh, in terms of even increasing our engagement is really in the context of this rapid and massive upskilling and reskilling that needs to be done. Uh, so Anurag, let me come to you. Do you at Wipro see employee skilling as a big agenda, important than ever before? And if so, you know, you could shed some light on it. I mean, it, it is a big agenda. You know, one, uh, you know, we being in IT services industry, the, the customer demands are so varied. The skills are so varied. And every day a new skill is coming up. How do you make sure that employees keep learning all the time? Right. And, and it's not really easy because, you know, nobody wants to learn like that. Right. At least we used to, you know, hold their hands and put them inside a room earlier. Now, how do you hold them and how do you bring them up? So there are certain things that you know we needed to do, right? One, one we said is, uh, you know, you said like a stick policy or a carrot policy, you know, or a reward policy that you do. Uh, so we have always been toying between the two. And one of the things we said is, okay, you must pick up one skill in a year. Now, right now, one skill in a year is uh, okay. It sounds easy, but then with one skill, everything, you know, your theory, your hands-on, your assessments, and 
everything you do some practice projects and all that kind of stuff so he said people below certain level uh, we actually announced a policy you should pick up one skill now what what if i don't pick up a skill if you don't pick up skill no problem but you know if you are aspiring to progress in life and you know go to play different roles you must in last 12 months you must pick have picked up one new skill before you can be progress to the next level right so some amount of stick some amount of motivation that you uh, wanted to uh, put in the uh, thing and one of the thing that nature of uh, business is changing is that uh, the specializations that we had that you know he or she is a project manager he or she is an architect um, um, uh, you know a developer or a tester and things like that all those lines are getting blurred now right so uh, it is uh, customers are expecting people to be full stack so i am the guy who will also do little bit of uh, project management little bit of uh, engineering or uh, you know uh, uh, getting involved with the design and development i am also the one who will be involved in user acceptance testing and that is what you see things becoming little full stack and that is why the concept of a project manager is changing there will be no pro- pure play project managers down the road you know they will be they be already calling them engineering managers right where the person has to have a technical blend now while the new set of pool of people that come in and you build these engineering managers it is much easier what do you do with the existing people who have been being a project manager for last 15 years and now you tell the guy the guy that you know you have lost technology 5 years back and you know how do you bring him to a level not at 30000 feet level but something which is little more hands on uh, to the uh, thing and and that is where a bigger challenge is and when you ask these people to come and take up a project management certification or training program you, you know there is some amount of fear some amount of resistance from these guys even though they know that they need to do it because that fear factor what if i fail what if i am not able to catch up with the rest of the crowd uh, to do that activity right and 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 that is where uh, you know you need a different level of mentorship with these senior guys uh, that you know now you are sitting in a classroom where there is a fresher or you know somebody very junior is sitting as well as you are sitting in the same class where you are learning a new technology that is coming up cloud has come as a new technology so if cloud something that a 3 year person has to know a 15 year person has to know and to the level of depth would be kind of similar in nature right so so that is where you know while we are building a pool of project managers architects as specialists we still have those specialist programs but the nature of the programs have changed where Uh, you know, a big chunk of that element you know is where you do hands on on some of the technological elements also that you uh, bring into the play so that is something that i would say as far as the laterals are concerned or the senior people in the existing right. pool of these people is concerned i don't know if you can add one more point a mm-hmm. lot of people that we are hiring for market see you need people with certain skills for market market as somebody said you know is dried out you don't have those people available now what do you do when when you are not able to find you still have to do a business right and that is why this concept of n minus 1 hiring has started right so you you hire people at an n minus 1 level you take them inside for, first you train the person you put them in a training room for 4 weeks 5 weeks 6 weeks groom the person to n skill and then deploy the person so now mm. that is the next level of uh, uh, this one happening okay i'm not getting the right product so i let me take a raw product and you know do something about it and do that and and that's a very very new paradigm that is happening and just a, a corollary to that new paradigm is there are many uh, you know third party companies which have come up many companies have come up they have come with a model of hire train deploy where they are saying mm. okay you don't take the person and train the person you know we will hire it for you we will train the person uh, we will train him or her in whatever you want you come and evaluate the guy and then you take the person inside the organization and the risk is what something we will take if the person does fail up and all that thing so this is something that is happening uh, you know in this market where you said you know it is uh, you know person is not seeking a job job is seeking the person so now job is going back to the homes of the people and say okay you know let me groom you let me train you once you are ready i will take you or i will take you train you pay you also and before you become productive you know so that's a small paradigm Love change it. that is happening yeah i totally love it n minus 1 hiring and since you spoke about uh jobs coming to people how can i not come to anuradha who's also nodding her head quite a bit so you know from a razor pay perspective anuradha how do you see this well um, i really enjoyed the uh, this uh, this answer from you and the the insights from you anurag fantastic 
I love how you bring a multi-dimensional facet to uh, uh, to how jobs are being looked at today, and that's something that that we uh, that we've really been able to experience a lot uh, at Razorpay over the last few years. Uh, I think world over we are we are evolving, no doubt about that. I think innovation in HR tech is is definitely uh, the new big thing, right? In the last couple of years, if you've, if you've seen, there are so many um, uh, HR tech organizations, startups that have, uh, uh, that have boomed and, you know, they're, they're giving so many different flavors to what we are looking at from, from, how we, uh, from how we deploy learning, what do we do about upskilling people, et cetera. I think, Along with that, there's also, I feel that there's a need for the, uh, the academicians to think differently. I think think beyond the textbooks now, right? I think human capital management um, has to in some way get into, uh, get into uh, academics. The fundamentals in so many ways has to be re-looked at. While there is this concept of uh, multidimensional skill, there is this concept of, uh, uh, of bringing in different flavors to uh, to a job profile and not restricting it only to the depth that uh, that we've been looking at for so many years i think the next three to five years i think a lot of these frameworks will new frameworks will emerge which will be adopted by i think uh, i think new age workforce continuing with what anurag said i think a whole lot of things needs to be re-looked at and which is what we're trying to do now. For example, um, uh, the way we would look at productivity um, last many years is very different from how we look at it today. Um, engagement and all of these, I think in so many ways new, need a new lens to, uh, uh, to adapt to what people want today and how do you look at it from a learning perspective also and upskilling perspective. Now, Whatever be our primary skills, I think a lot of emphasis will now also go on upskilling behavioral skills of people. Let's look at it uh, from, uh, from the current situation of a hybrid model that is there. When there is a hybrid model, how do you continue to build respect for people within, within your own systems? Um, when, I, when I talk about respect, I also talk about you know, how you live up to your commitments. For example, um, your your work is probably dependent uh, or your completion of your work is probably dependent on somebody else right so how do you upskill people on on these uh, on work ethics on delivery on uh, on time management etc i think they are taking a lot of a lot of significance today in how we are going to bring about a, a holistic um, um, individual into into the system for example yeah. now if you're working in in remote locations if there isn't a way that you're able to communicate and continue to keep the audience and your peers engaged in so many ways then then you know no matter what you do from a uh, from an upskilling perspective or uh, you know bring if you don't bring in the right kind of engagement all of this is going to be flat Right? Yeah. It's not going to succeed at all. So I think along with all of these, I think a lot of emphasis on behavioral skills is something that we are definitely looking at to bring about um, more responsible individuals into, uh, into the community. I also believe that there will be a lot of stress on well-structured work styles uh, mm. going to suit the new age workplace. I think agility, adaptability, all of these will bring in a lot of a uh, lot of success to future. So I think along with the multidimensional generalist kind of roles that we are going to look at, uh, ensuring that we give a lot of emphasis on, on creating well-rounded individuals from even a behavioral standpoint is going to be sustainable. And that is what we are trying to do at Razorpay today. Fantastic, love this. And uh, Dr. Jay Kumar, let me come to you. You know, uh, you, you were sharing some very interesting stats. 85% of jobs will go by 2030, 97 million new jobs will come. So how are you seeing, um, you know, this upskilling agenda at uh, You'll have to go off mute, please. Let, uh, let me share uh, one more piece of statistics, which mentioned in Gardner's report. Building critical skills and competencies are the topmost HR priority for 2022. 
and 65 to 70 percent of the HR managers say yes, that is the priority. So for every organization, uh, as I said, based on the total change in environment, as well as the, the disruption, skilling, upskilling, reskilling, or multi-skilling has become the topmost priority. And that too, when you are at, growing at a faster pace, let me take uh, my own organization. LNT, we are major, majority of the portion is from EPC, engineering, procurement, and construction, then high tech, manufacturing, and uh, services. That is the IT business, which is separate. If you take the EPC business brick and mortar, even though it is a pandemic, during this period, we have bagged a whole lot of jobs because the, the, the India is growing. If you look at the budget, uh, there was a 7.5 lakh crores of investment in infrastructure. We bagged more than many jobs, even at least one job itself, the high-speed rail itself is 3 billion, 25,000 crores, 26,000 crores is there to be completed in three to four years. So in a EPC, time is the essence of the contract. The more faster you complete, you make profit. If you delay the project, you are gone because of the higher charges, wages, working capital, et cetera. So how do you complete before time? How do you stay ahead of the competition is adopting technology. So if you look at it, we have gone on a digitalization drive. Uh, we have used IOTs, RFID to all our equipment. So any part of the India or the world, if the missionary is there, we know at what is the productivity, what is the fuel consumption, what is the, the, the preventive maintenance should be done, entire data flows to our headquarters and we have analytics for that. Uh, if you look at survey, earlier it was manual and other thing, now it is done through drones. Uh, building, uh, earlier it was 2D, 3D planning, it is now with business intelligence modeling, which, which before you make the building, the entire building along with this, uh, the pipelines, electricity, everything is seen by the engineer. So it, so whole lot of advancement, 3D printing. We have printed one plus one floor building at Kanchipuram through 3D printing. Um, so if you have to bring all these things, how do I change the people? It is continuous training, skilling, upskilling, different types of online learning or digital learning or classroom learning or hybrid learning. So that is a major push at all the levels. Next, come to the leadership talent. If you have to scaling up the top position, every organization, let it be, be, be pro, let it be any razor pay, the leadership talent is a scarcity. So how do you, one source is hiring, but we, build, we strongly believe in developing our own uh, talent. So at every level we identify, we have a competency framework. We have identified the top talent. We use an assessment center. Then we put them through a very, very structured way of uh, leadership development. Uh, in addition, we are also now, because of the change, entering into many new age businesses. We have gone into LNT Edutech, which is typically into technical education, online education, including VLIT, virtual instructor led training, et cetera, in terms of civil, mechanical, electrical engineering. That's a new business. Same way we have gone into e-commerce. We have started a business called LNT Sufin, which is an um, Amazon and Flipkart for, for engineering goods. If you want to steal cement from walls, thing it is it is the Sufin that's a new business we have started. We have gone into data center business. So since the environment is changing, the to, to we are changing our portfolios. We are into new business. This all needs again um, uh, movement of many of the talent from internal, and then you have to train them and develop them. So for us, skilling, upskilling, multi-skilling is a continuous process because of all these factors. It's, it's yeah. a necessity. You cannot survive without that. It's a necessity. You can't survive without it. I totally agree. And, uh, you know, clearly there is this skills gap. And uh, Dr. Jaykumar, you also spoke about how you kind of identifying some of that uh, skill gap. Um, so let me ask my next question to Nikita. Nikita, uh, what role do you think data and insights play when it comes to informing your reskilling agenda, really bridging the skills gap, um, just like Dr. Chekumar's you know, spoke about just now. And then interestingly, uh, when we were looking at uh, development, we spoke about development as a fresh agenda. But if you see all our roles, we all have been doing development for the last two decades at least, you know, in, in our own capacity or more maybe. And every evolution brings in a new agenda of development. 
So when we move to the computer age, we were talking about developing people on learning to use systems, learning to make things more efficient, you know, quickly being agile to faster ways of working. And say now where we stand today, we're talking about a completely new agenda on development. It's interesting to see what falls out this agenda. And many a times it is about what we measure. So all your organization matrix actually eventually become a derivative of what is it that you want to develop in your people. So initially we used to measure productivity, performance, bottom line, looking at where you want to grow, which product, which market, which segment, and all the learning agenda used to get derived of that. So there would be programs on product development, sales strategies, helping people build selling skills. But today, what are we measuring? You now we are measuring team climate, we are measuring associate experience, we are measuring uh, you know, customer centricity, we are measuring customer intimacy and so many more things that we never measured before. And what is that doing to us? You know, that's actually calling out more set of insights, more set of value information, which actually feeds into the developmental pathways and tells us that, hey, it's not only your functional skills, it's not only your technical skills, it's not only the skills which are required for you to perform your job or perform your task, but there is something more to this for you to be fully in your potential. And that something more could be behavioral, like what Anuradha mentioned, it could be system, like what Anurag mentioned, or it could just be creating the right team climate, having the next set of leadership skills which the future is demanding. And it, it is unique and different for each role and each function in the organization. What we're also in touch with is that the diversity of talent in the organization has also shifted a lot. We earlier used to have very fixed term employment talent, uh, people who would come nine to six, work in one organization for a longer stint. Okay, uh, shorter became five, six years, but still there was a reasonable time that people would spend in the organization. We moved to an age where we're talking about gig economy, where we're talking about uh, you know, outsourcing, we're talking about build by borrow, we're talking about you know, people who could just come for a day and complete an assignment and not show up to your organization thereafter. And that has a very direct correlationship to how we see learning. We cannot only have a nine months integrated learning development program. We cannot only have a classroom learning program because you don't know how is your next working arrangement of the future going to look like. And hence, you know, all of this data, when you look at it together, it actually demystifies and tells us that the learning of the future is going to be extremely hyper-customized. Uh, you know, you would have to bring the learning agenda closer to the persona that you're dealing with. And each persona is unique. Each persona is having its own nuances, its own needs. The beauty of the process is that when you look at learning agendas, where is your starting point? Is your starting point the developmental needs that you derive out of a learning catalog or a learning cycle that just starts? Or is your starting point your organization strategy, which actually talks about business data, which talks about the diversified information that gets discussed as an outcome of the business data. And then you know, what do you really want to build for the future? You know, So for us, that has been the biggest shift that we have seen in the last couple of years. Very well said. And I'll borrow from what you said, You know, what's your starting point? Uh, Anurag, can I ask you this question? What's your starting point and how do you find that data? Yeah, so the starting point has changed actually. Uh, we are now a full-fledged business function, uh, right? So anything that you, so if you say, you know, I generated a pool of so many people, it's said, so you wasted company's resources to, you know, do that training, right? Because what is the use of that pool unless that pool is used by the business? I mean, don't take me literally. But so the, the, the way the data insights is coming is not about just the developmental um, uh, you know, information about an individual that I have so many skills and I need so many skills in future. That is just one element of it. The bigger element right now is where are the demands that are there in the system? So anything that you do uh, that, you know, how many people to train on what skills and all that kind of stuff, it is about uh, the demands that are there in the system 
which keeps varying every quarter on quarter you, you look at the whole demand view you look at what is the current skill sets that are there in the organization and do a mapping with the demands and the skill sets to say where the gap is right now that's a very continuous process and and it is not very easy because there are no uh, set roles that are there many times you look at customer accounts they their combination of skills they required would be a plus b plus c or a plus b plus f or you know and and that makes it a little more complex that when a particular account customer account needs so some amount of data and then you say okay this person is maybe 60% ready or 70% ready and these are the skills that you need to add to that particular person so when i mentioned earlier that you know we are saying that every individual should pick up one new skill in the organization let me qualify that better and it said you should pick up that one new skill based on the basket of skills that is given to you and the basket of skills is different based on different business groups that you may have right and based on the so apart from that you can go and learn anything you want because my learning management system is there you can learn anything you want but what is kind of mandated is that you you have to pick up this new skill and that is where the data insights come uh, very handy you may have an over supply of certain skill and the demand is low and then your dependence on external hiring becomes very high uh, right uh, so um, and on the other side you may sit on a large pool of bench um that would happen while you are still hiring for market because this bench is not ready for the demands that you have and that is where uh, and believe me it is not a struggle that you know people, anybody has come on top of you know because that that it keeps changing the demands keep changing and and that is where uh, you know uh, we look at data and insights from that perspective that uh, look at demand view look at what individuals have fix up the gaps create basket of skills based on business groups keep training reskilling that that pool of people that is required to be able to do that activity and that way it become little more of a if i can use the word of inventory management uh, not the not used for human capital but uh, when i look at it uh, you need a lot of skills around that area to be able to plan those kind of skills of course yeah. i mean there is a there is an lnd element there is an hr element where you say okay every individual has to pick up the skills what they need because individuals also have aspirations right so you may be putting me on this skill but i have an aspiration to work on something very emerging and uh, uh, very different right so so we do have the sub parallel track that, okay this is something that your business needs but if you have aspiration to work on this you can build in a certification on those areas maybe in your next assignment 6 months to 1 year down the road and we have a cap of 18 months that you know if you have completed 18 months in an assignment we will give you a, a preference over what you really want to do if you have picked up a new skill during this 18 months period and we will move you into your area of choice and things like that so that is where you mix and match between what business needs what an employee aspiration would be yeah, yeah. and you saw right skills is definitely the new currency and understanding the demand and supply of it whether we call it inventory management or something else uh, is totally understandable and i think it becomes you know even more complex uh, when there is the kind of scale that you have a uh you know the respective companies that you represent uh so let me ask imani this question now how do you kind of build these right skills and that to at scale um so i think um, uh, it's 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 definitely i think one thing even though we've ta- talked a lot about transformation one thing that hasn't changed is that we are still very much in you know, sort of aligned with businesses and whatever happens uh, irrespective of what sort of uh, you know um, uh, fluctuations and volatile work environments that we may be in uh, still there is that you know uh, the need for the bottom line to understand what is going on businesses want us uh, as lnd professionals to be uh, you know um, to speaking in terms of being in, in aligned with what they what they're looking for and that has not changed and that will not change either so uh what is what is interesting to know is that when this happens uh it, it, this the we we sit in vast data lakes of information that is there for us and sometimes it is uh Uh, it is being able to take this information and being able to spell it out in a way that will um resonate with uh, the operations resonate with c suite that is what is expected and that is what we do uh, so uh, what they say is there's that a b c d of always be collecting data and always be connecting the dots 
right? Uh, so it's that uh, you know the, the 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 doubled way of looking at it in terms of like you you not only do you have to collect the information that's there, but you have to connect those dots. You have to be able to spell it out. And when LND is able to do that, there is the the solution that you are providing. So. So sometimes I think uh, um, Nikita, if I'm not mistaken, touched on the fact that uh, you know you have to you have to see in terms of what is it that uh, your your businesses are looking at at the moment, and you being able to articulate that in a way that will resonate to them is what's really important here. So um, if it is uh, say for example, what are the things that we are really going to measure? The matrices that we're looking at, things like that, right? So. Uh, um, we have been constantly uh, speaking to our businesses, understanding what is the requirements that they want in terms of uh, the dashboards that they need to have at their fingertips from a learning perspective. Whilst it is looked at operationally as well, we have to be able to align to that. And when it is uh, things like, for example, um, time to productivity is something that we have always been looking at, maybe from a new hire perspective, right? Where else every day with the things that are changing now, we are adjusting to something new. So all of us become new recruits in a way to something that we, we didn't envisage yesterday, right? So this time to productivity is how fast you can transform someone to some new role, to a new skill, to be able to uh, align that, to be able to uh, respond to a business faster. So that is the way in which we look at the scale of things. And when you are in businesses which are um, not uniform, when I come from a business that is a, a diversified conglomerate, you have to keep wearing multiple hats and understanding whether you are speaking the, you know, you are speaking from the same chorus book. Uh, and that is something that we've been looking at. It's fantastic. And I love the ABCD mantra, always be collecting data. Uh, let me move to Dr. Jay Kumar. And always uh, be connecting uh, those dots. And always Not be only just collecting the data. <laughs> Absolutely. So the, yes, ABCD <laughs> followed by another ABCD. And uh, Dr. Jay Kumar, you know, uh, specifically, you know, when it comes to, let's say, technology or tools or platforms, have you seen them playing a role as far as scaling these efforts is concerned? Definitely, uh, Samir. Uh, that too, with, with the so much of technology around and with a diversified business and a varied location, people working in project sites across India and abroad, you cannot bring in effective learning unless you use processor platforms and tools, etc., which is available. So we use all the, the technology available. We use online, we use blended. If you look at all the online platforms, you name any, we have most of the bigger platforms we have that. Uh, we are deeply into micro learning. We have an app called Rappel, which is which is continuously which gives quizzes as well as say, the the right or wrong answer, gamified with etc. We also do a lot of curated learning, um, and uh, uh, in fact, we have a uh, lot of uh, regular training because uh, in fact we have so much of training infrastructure. Uh, we have a three-stage capability development program, which is we are focusing on business leadership, project leadership, as well as technical leadership. And we have a structured form of, of competencies for each of the level. But then we put them through a center, we identify the gaps, and then in whether it is platform, whether it is a regular thing, we all the courses are linked to the competency. If a person goes to a competency, then he knows what are the courses available with him in the digital platform and what is the time required, how to complete it, and based on that, a self-evaluation, et cetera. And we also have a structured seven-step leadership. And we have 18 training centers. Can you believe it? We have one at Lonavala. We have the Project Management Institute in Baroda. We have a Technical Training Institute, Mysore, as well as in Mumbai, Mad. We have Safety Innovation School, RAIN Training School, Tunneling Academy, uh, construction skills training institute, nine institute across. So now with all these things, we are bringing in platform technology inside that and we are making it uh, blended. So we effectively use that regular conventional training along with the platform technology uh, and analytics to make it effective. Fantastic. Blended learning really is the mantra. And rather from, a, from the perspective of razors, uh, what role is technology playing? 
uh, see for us it is it's more about um, you know how how imani mentioned right how do you how do you listen to what people want to do how do you then connect that and act on that right so i think the traditional ways of uh, employ employability gap today um is is varying in a lot of in a lot of sense earlier it used to be a lot of a uh, lot of depth and uh, super specialization but i think here today in this forum itself i think each of us have touched upon the fact that agility adaptability all of these are necessary not only from the tools that we have but also in the way we are thinking in the way we want our own people also to adapt to this so again i bring i go back to uh, um talent which needs multi dimensionality uh, in the future for example an engineer with a creative bent of mind an engineer with maybe an economics background uh, you know a psychology background i think they bring a lot of diverse perspectives today and and when when there are these new flavors that are there in the talent space i think these are the ones who will have a lot of edge over over the others in uh, in the future and how do we change our thinking and perspectives to embrace the modern workspace scenarios and what people want to do i think organizations will will play a key game changing role when you are able to adapt to this new need of what our millennials gen, uh, um, gen z all of them what right and and i think progressive workspaces are already seeing a lot of value in these and they are making way for these modern thinkers and uh, multi uh, multi dimensional skills i think investing in people personalities for me is one of the key things that i will go back to uh, and by that i mean to say that there are there are several young achievers right how do you how do you ensure that you know that they sustain the success that they see how do you continuously keep them growing to be able to sustain that and what are the tools that will that will allow for uh, for hyper customization personalization and one key element that i want to bring here is autonomy i think gone are the days when you're going to tell people what they should learn i think it is more about listening to what they want to do and how do you build an autonomous system for them to for them to work on and the tools that will allow for these autonomy and uh, upskilling based on based on the need and interest of these people and bring in a large engagement uh, to that i think those are the ones that will work for us you know um, to give an example i think slack has worked fantastically for us in terms of uh, peer to peer learning transparency in sharing information being able to you know pick up on things from others finding finding solutions to a lot of problems that you don't know of and and when i say these are not just work related problems that are the people are talking about you know you could discuss maybe uh, how do you cope with you know certain stressful situations that are happening you know that's also a learning for somebody isn't it how do you blend all of these together and what tools will enable this engagement and uh, uh, and and continuous learning in different modules i think those are the ones that have worked for us yeah yeah fantastic and one thing is very clear that um, we've seen so much of a change in the past couple of years that we've never seen before and one of the things that i'm always curious about is how are we or are we even relooking at the way we measure our success or look at roi um, so nikita let me um, ask you this question how are you measuring the success of your lnd programs today is it the same as it used to be before qualitative feedback and things like that or has it evolved based on some of these things that have been discussed today yeah so in the there has been definitely a very big shift in the way we look at roi and in fact at acg we don't use the word roi like i said i have a personal itch to the word roi and perhaps that comes from the limitation of how it is defined you know so the moment to talk about ROI it gives you an indicator that it has to be something which is tangible it has to be something which is numeric and something which is very clearly indicating the return on every money that is put on for a program or, or on an initiative and hence we shifted the needle from measuring ROI only to making it more holistic and looking at what is the collective value an initiative offers 
And the moment you look at collective value, it also creates collective ownership because the moment you talk about ROI, the entire accountability of measuring it comes to the LND team or comes to the person who's actually making use of that money to make an impact happen. Uh, so we have several uh, metrics that we have designed. To begin with, the first thing that we're measuring is the learning agility scores. Uh, and the learning agility scores are in fact designed to help each associate, each employee understand what is his or her own agility to learning. And there are several parameters that come together to measure that. So in fact, that comes even before you measure the program impact score. Because if you have a low learning agility score as a group, uh, it is very unlikely that the program will have high impact, you know, because it has a very direct correlation to how well I'm invested into the program to what the program has to offer to me. So uh, for us, that's the starting point. Uh, it is very, very well governed because each person realizes that uh, I am invested not only in terms of cost that the organization is putting in, but my own value of time, my own value of stepping away from my day's job or my responsibility or my project assignments to take up something which I need to upgrade for. And these learning agility scores for us are also linked back to promotions, linked back to critical decisions on the associates, linked back to which kind of projects we want to offer to that associate, whether the person forms a part of the key talent pool or the top talent pool, because that's when you're driving seriousness. That's when you're saying that what we want to promote as a learning culture are those associates who learn more and are constantly agile to upgrade themselves. So it also enables in creating that culture of continuous learning. The second thing that we're also measuring is the manager climate. Now, uh, why are we measuring manager climate? Because we've been long talking that you know manager plays a very important role in learning, but it's always been very qualitative. And uh, we do give feedback if somebody does not show up for a program, we do have those corridor conversations to nudge manager to help them uh, that supporting environment. But what? how do we really uh, quantify that? How do we make it measurable for us to know that which manager is taking that extra time, which manager is ensuring that once the person comes back from a learning program or is being given a new project for a, for a exponential exposure, there is something that the manager is offering in addition to the reviews in addition to the project management or the goal setting conversations, which actually tells us the interest of the manager in building the team. So that's where the manager agility scores come in. Uh, the third score is obviously the program effectiveness score, which actually talks about uh, how well is the program being experienced? What is the shift of behavior or skill that the program has been able to offer? And we also have a sustainability score which actually talks about not the immediate outcome of the program, but if we were to see a delta after six months or after one year and look at learning behavior adoption or look at shift in the performance of those individuals or look at shift in the experience that those individuals are creating to diverse stakeholder groups. Is there been a shift? Is there been a learning integration? Is there been some way of learning transfer? Now, all these four data points together create the holistic impact that we want to measure. And what that does is whenever we actually talk about impact, it just kind of splits the entire accountability to each person in the organization to talk about making it successful together. So one of the taglines that we've been following consistently in the organization is that we make it better together. And you know, it's not about a learning organization or a learning function saying that how can I make you better? But it's about we all saying it together that how do we make it better together? So that, that's our way of measuring the impact. How do we make it better together? Absolutely love it. Uh, Dr. Jay Kumar, uh, what would you like to add? Yeah, very nice. Yeah, very impressive. Learning agility score, program impact score, manager climate, uh, program effective score, sustainability score. Uh, very impressive. See, we still follow some of the traditional method as well as all of uh, reaction, learning, um, application, uh, business results and return on. Are you, am I clear? Am I audible? 
Am I audible? Uh, you're audible now. There was a little bit of a like, but, yeah. So but, uh, all the traditional measures we do, but now because of digitalization and hybrid mode as well as the online learning. There are some new measures which we brought in, like the number of learning hours, number of unique learners, the, the um, uh, average uh, digital learners, which have been tracked. In addition, there is learning effectiveness index, which uh, talks about the uh, some of the, based on various parameters, it gives uh, a grouping of uh, return, how much of the learning has happened, retention and recall, uh, depth and width of the learning which has happened. Uh, how much they educate and share that it is typically the the manager climate how they educate how they share it with others such things are also being measured but for me according to me the most important measure for a training effectiveness is how many of your strategic goals have been achieved because of the training um, how many of the client positions or new requirements are filled because of the internal training and moving that how many new positions you have closed how much of attrition you could reduce because of training as a as a as a um, EVP in the organization? A person wants to learn and grow in the organization. These are the very key measures. How much of my strategic goals are achieved? How much of my client needs are achieved? How much of, of attrition I have retained? These are some of the measures which is but difficult to measure and correlate. But these are the key measures for effectiveness. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thanks for this and. Uh... Uh, I definitely want to open it up uh, for our audience. But before that, Anurag, uh, any last words from you as far as this measurement and ROI? I also said? can't stop reacting to what Nikita said. You know, these things like learning agility score, sustainability score. I really, I really admire if you guys are able to measure these kind of things. And maybe I should connect offline someday to figure out that. Uh, in our organization, you know, it's all about the outcome-based uh, thing that we have gone into. Uh, that if a person has learned something, then the person will be able to, you know, work on it in a customer engagement kind of a thing. So, for example, uh, freshers, uh, you know, we hire like this year we are hiring some forty thousand freshers from campuses. Now, how do you make sure that French freshers are ready? So, one new metric we came up with is day one billing ready, right? So, uh, so which means that even before the fresher joins the organization, you are saying the person is actually ready to be deployed on a project. So we started in you know one semester before the thing you know we, we we give this whole programs and labs and everything to the fresher so the person finishes it before he or she joins the organization so you get measured on a one day one billing readiness but more importantly something called a fresher index which means that if there are 100 people working in a project uh, you know you're saying 20 percent of those people should be fresher from campus who is built now, the, if you are reaching that level, then you said, yes, you know, your, your training has been effective so that the pressure has been, uh, you know, is ready to be deployed. The other one you will look at is internal fulfillment, right? So today you hire a lot of people from the market, right? So, so when you have, say, internal fulfillment percentage that given a particular requirement, how much percentage of demand is getting fulfilled internally? Now, it's sometimes very difficult to say internally due to reskilling or internally otherwise. But we say, okay, today there is a baseline of this. We need to go here. And if training and reskilling is doing that activity, so most of my metrics, outcome metrics, are something where I am not directly responsible. You know, I cannot directly impact. I have to work with two other stakeholders who actually deploy these people to say, make that thing happen, uh, right? And, and, and these are, and some, something else like a rotation index. So given this demand, a lot of people have to rotate their current people to the new demands and replace them with freshers. So, but the rotation can only happen if you have reskilled the person so that he or she can take up the demand on an emerging skill. So, uh, most of these metrics are, you know, towards an outcome that you uh, decide. Yeah. yeah, lots of indexes and uh, all outcome driven. Love that. We'll open it up uh, for questions now. And I think PP has joined just at the right time. Uh, we have one already on chat as we get more. And uh, for the audience, please feel free to just raise your hand, come live and ask your questions directly. But we had one question from Sanita Singh. Uh, the question is that employees frequently request that the company assists them in advancing their careers. What role can l &D play in this, especially in the remote working culture? Um, somebody wants to volunteer to take this question. Maybe or, I can share the okay. practice. Yeah, yes, I can share the practice which we have just introduced uh, two years back uh, when we were in the midst of COVID. So we have a very interesting thing called DIY toolkit for career, and it actually uh, 
is a very uh, exhaustive document and a, less like a document, more like a toolkit, which actually helps you to come to your career preference through a series of tools that you have to take it up yourself. So it generally would take a person two days and we tell the individual that do it on a weekend, sit with your family, sit with somebody who you are close to, could be a friend, could be a partner, could be wife, could be anybody that you uh, feel would consult you well uh, in making a career choice, but not somebody from the organization. And the DIY toolkit is designed in a way which helps you uh, make a career choice from a clean slate. It, it doesn't uh, govern you by your education. It doesn't govern you by what role you're playing today. It doesn't govern you from making a choice based on what your psychological constructs or normings would have been as, as a child or as parents communication or as peer communication. But it tells you uh, to make a choice based on what you really wish to contribute to this world. What's the purpose that you want to live with and how would you like to take up your next career move, which will come closer, which will get you closer to what you want to do. And Subsequent to launching the DIY toolkit, we did it for all our 4,000 associates. And we actually had a handful, 100 associates of key talent who are our top performers, where we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each one of them along with their manager. And for us, that was the test of the entire process. Because when you really give a person the freedom to completely choose at the age of 40, at the age of 50, at the age of 35, they would have never imagined that there is a life which can give them a choice to do things differently. And then you also said, okay, if you want to make that choice happen, these are the career trajectories that are open to you, which are non-linear. The linear ones are easy to handle because they follow the standard, standard career architecture. But there is also a non-linear path. And how do we as an organization work along with you to make those choices happen? Because you would not want a dissatisfied associate working with you who's dreaming about something else every time. You want a person who is fully functional, fully engaged, being part of your organization. And even we've had those conversations with associates where we said that, how do we design a developmental journey where maybe not immediately, maybe after four years, you get a little closer to your purpose and be in your full potential. I personally feel that it's just about designing these conversations. It's just about creating that safe space for people to say, that this is what I wish to contribute in the next time to come. You know, if we don't create that safe space, you will only hear careers which will be equal to the next promotion, you know, which will be equal to the next position in the hierarchy. And that's not real career. We all know it, you know, that's not what we ourselves tell ourselves when we talk about our own dreams, right? So uh, how do we create something similar in the organization? I think for us, that's been the next, a leap of faith that we are putting in. And I'm assuming that more organizations will have to do that. You know, for more people searching for purpose, if organizations don't do that, shifts will not happen. Yeah. And Anurag, I see you unmuted. Did you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah. I mean, see, from a career perspective, you know, many people want to take up higher degrees and all that thing, you know, and they quit the organization to take up that. So we kind of offer that uh, if you... Uh, uh, like an MBA program, we tie up with a college uh, MBA, which is MBA is done on a weekend basis. So Monday to Friday, do regular work. One of the Saturdays or Sundays, professors from that college will teach you. And after two years, you get an MBA degree. Similarly, we have an MTech program. I think Anuradha was talking about varied type of people joining. So we take a lot of BSc graduates who are uh, not engineers, uh, but uh, they aspire to become engineers and they aspire to work in the IT industry. So we take a lot of BSc guys. We give them an MTech degree after four years. We tie up the, with one of the institutes who professors come and teach them on weekends. And after four years, they get an MTech degree. Advantage for the organization is that they are captive with you for four years because till they are doing MTech, you know, they don't leave. Risk is only after that. But for the individual, they remain motivated to work with you and because they will get their end degree to that extent. So there are some kind of tie-ups like that we do uh, for career of these people, yeah. We, we also yeah. have a whole right. lot of uh, tie-ups. We have an MTech program with IIT, Delhi, IIT, mm -hmm. Chennai, and uh, NIT Surat Kalfur, uh, NIT Tirchi. So then we have a um, program with IIM Ahmedabad, MBA program. We have a program with SP Jain. We have a three-year MBA program with IFMR, all done during the doing this. So that 
they learn while they, they uh, earn. We have an ICW center inside our campus in Chennai. So that's how we ensure that people continuously learn in the um, just to add to that, uh, I think from an internal perspective, and especially since Sanita had spoken about the remote working environment and what can be done uh, in terms of career advancement there, one of the things that we've looked at is connecting, uh, because our, our company is a diversified group, connecting with internal mentors the, uh, cross-functionally. This has been something that we found even for the mentors, because they are working in uh, remote locations, they're working in a high environment connecting online they are able to give more time and space for for these conversations and we found that this has worked very well uh, so from a career advancement perspective uh, this sort of connects that we have worked out so you may for example we have people from the transportation sector who are speaking to senior VPs from the retail sector uh, so it is a, a fresh outlook, uh, a perspective that they have been seeking, which they have been able to get through the internal talent that we have itself. So we capitalized on that to a large scale over the last uh, two years. So just wanted to add that too. You know, fantastic. Thanks for adding that. And Anuradha, we have to hear from you as well. So for us, um, I think it's mostly to do with a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning like Imani spoke about, right? We use, we use what we already have from, uh, from the existing talent base to try and see how people can upskill and how they can learn and advance in their careers. Um, like Nikita also mentioned, we are, we are very for people trying out new things. We believe that it adds a lot of different perspectives to the already existing way of working. If, if let's say somebody from, uh, from sales wanted to understand a little bit about product, can they have a small stint in that where they see if they truly can, can make that work for them? Someone in, in a technical support wants to get into uh, engineering while we don't have very specific programs devised for it. If uh, we do create opportunities and the environment is, is safe for people to come and speak about what they want to do and where they want to be. It is very important for us as an organization that we take people closer to their dreams because that is where I think magic happens. That's where a lot of a lot of what you truly want to do um, comes out in in the best way possible. So there is excellence in in where you want to do and how our organization is able to harness this and harness that and foster it for people. I think that for us is very important. Um, and apart from that, I think we also seek mentors from the connects that we have. We have uh, organizations in the Silicon Valley founder networks that, that allow us to uh, uh, bring in people internally for us to, uh, for us to have WhatsApp sessions where you, uh, you're able to ask them questions, you're able to pose different problems and try and understand from their life experiences of what has happened and how we can learn from that. And then there's also plateau for engineers and uh, and product folks who uh, who can schedule. It's a marketplace for uh, of of mentors, and it is a Silicon Valley based organization, and that allows people to speak to people who have seen scale, who have seen problems that we have probably not yet experienced in some of our roles, etc. Gives them a lot of real life advantage and experience from from these set of folks. Makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, we're kind of uh, nearing the end of this round table, but we can't end this before we do a rapid fire. So let me do a quick rapid fire with each one of you. Uh, sorry, um, Samira, before uh, you proceed, let me yeah. just uh, quickly barge in there. I'd just like to announce to all our delegates, please, uh, you do have the option of uh, raising your hand and asking questions to our expert speakers here. So please do that. We will give you access through voice chat and we'll be unmuting you. So once again, if you have any questions for our speakers, uh, please do go ahead and uh, raise your hand. Thank you. Yes, Samir. Well, thank you very much, Deepi, for this announcement. I'm sure this gave our panelists enough time to mentally prepare themselves for a rapid fire. Just one question. So the question is, uh, if you were to describe the future of L&D in one sentence, what would that sentence be? And Anurag has unmuted himself, so maybe we'll start with him. <laughs> <laughs> then I don't want to go with the first one. So. Okay, so who wants to be the first one? Okay, let me uh, go for it, uh, only because I can... 
only because I can borrow a line that I have lived by, and that is that never stop learning because life never stops teaching. So that is the future. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, we move to Dr. Jay Kumar. Learning is a continuous process. Now it has become much rapid. You have to be agile in learning. Also. Sure. So I will say, so you have to future-proof yourself. So learning organization has to future-proof the employees. That's yeah. Going Great. forward, life said about uh, uh, life satisfaction and no longer job satisfaction, really. So. Love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Nikita, you have the last word? Yeah, learning is liberation. So if you wish for freedom, learn more. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. In fact, so, in fact learning yeah. agility has become one of our competency itself for leadership. Mm. Uh, right. And uh, like, do you want to talk a little bit more about this learning agility, the competence, um, and how you kind of uh, running it? So, you know, we have defined what is learning agility. And in the assessment center, when we look at an instantly a situation is given, how a person is able to pick up threads and put that concept into this, that gets measured and get a score of your learning agility. So that you, you have to continuously look at loose ends, dots, and how you connect towards it and move forward. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes a lot of sense. And Nikita also kind of touched upon learning agility. That's fantastic. So great. Uh, and uh, what I will request everyone to do before I hand it over to Deepthi is to please take the poll. Uh, tell us how we did. Uh, uh, if this was a good use of your time. Uh, Deepthi, over to you to share the details, please. Well, uh, thank you so much, Samir. And I have to say what a great uh, session this has been. Uh, we do have some more questions coming in for the audience. I just want to check with the speakers uh, if they're okay to answer them um, in terms of time. Uh, are we okay to answer them? Because I can see some more comments and questions coming in. I think we can take about two more questions. So we, we have a question here that says, how can we create the next frontier for l &D leaders to effectively manage talent? Uh, so uh, who would like to take this for this gentleman who has asked us this question? What is the question? I didn't get the question clear. Uh, I'll just repeat that, sir. How can we create the next frontier for l &D leaders to effectively manage talent? My feeling is uh, uh, many a times the learner himself does not know what he wants to learn, right? So if organization can help in, in each of the level, what is the competency required? What is the skill? Uh, what is the proficiency level required? And then if I have to reach that proficiency level, what are the, uh, the learning um, um, content available with them in various things so that he, he should be in a position to measure himself. He should be in a position to identify the gap. And then he should be in a position to go there and do his self-learning and then take an assessment to see that, yes, I am moving ahead. So he should know at each level, at each position, what is the skill, um, competency, or uh, attitude and uh, things required and uh, allow them to self-learn and grow. Um, so if I could just uh, put a different spin on that as well, we also have a very informed learner now, uh, uh, as uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, people know what they want, people know exactly where they want to head. So when when you have learners like that, managing that, le that talent of leadership for the future uh, makes you also have to be a very informed learning professional, right? Uh, so it's not just the horizon that you see just, uh, and if you, if you've, you've just look into the periphery of what you're seeing, then you have lost uh, the race there itself. So as learning professionals uh, to manage this talent of the future, we need to be as informed in terms of future prospects as much as there, because information is at the fingertips. If they don't find it from you, they will reach out to someone else. So uh, I feel that is also something that we need to do to manage uh, the talent of the future. I agree, I agree. Just, that, that. just, yes, I fully agree. It is not this or that, it is this and that. In addition exactly. to the whole, whole canvas available for him to learning, we should also nudge them, guide them, and take them. They say life is like a box of chocolates. You don't know what you'll choose. So uh, it's, it's yeah, very much. You know, and, and extending, Imani, so while, yes, they're informed learners and they, you know, they learn, the question is a lot of times they learn things and then they keep doing what they were doing yesterday. 
So, uh, uh, you know, I would expect a LND professional also to take the horse to the cart, right? So basically the person has learned and there are to even help the individual to get into a new project or assignment or a role or whatever it is where they can, uh, you know, kind of uh, <clears throat> apply what they have learned new. And that is also one element which is a lot of times missing. Plus there are different uh, learning styles. So you should have a mix of things, okay, in terms of simulation, in terms of learning content in terms of practical experimentation. Somebody talked about mentoring, somebody talked about uh, on the job training. So you should have a mix of things so that based on the learning style, the person is able to pick up things faster. And also listen a lot, right? Listen yeah. to what people people want to do. I think, you know, uh, we're always telling people what they should do. Uh, we're never hearing enough is, uh, um, is, is my view on a lot of things, not just this. When you listen, I think you're able to curate what they want. And that brings in a lot of success. And success obviously brings in a lot of motivation to do new things and, and do better. So to me, it's it's a lot of listening and curating programs based on that. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that. Such, such uh, great perspectives there. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for that quick poll that we had spoken about earlier. So coming up on your screens are two simple yes, no questions. It's just going to take a few seconds of your time. So we request you to take this session, uh, quick poll, please. It will help us to know your feedback and serve you better. So I'm just waiting uh, for everybody to respond and uh, have enough responses and then we'll move on. Just a few seconds to click your answers. This is uh, your quick feedback on the conversation. So quickly click on yes or no and submit your valuable feedback to us. All right, just a simple click of a button and uh, I think uh, that's enough time for the poll. All right, we may have had enough uh, responses by now. So thank you so much for uh, sharing your feedback with us. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude this round table. Thank you so much, Samir, for uh, having wonderfully uh, moderated this session. And uh, we've had such uh, valuable insights and information uh, and uh, insights uh, shared in this conversation. And uh, of course, we extend a big thank you to every one of our panelists for their valuable time and expert contributions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining the CLO Roundtable brought to you by ET in association with LinkedIn Talent Solutions. We are positive that you have had many, many great learnings in this session and that will set you up for success in the future. So keep learning for as Steve Jobs said, learn continually. There's always one more thing to learn. With that, this is your host Deepti Divan signing off. We'll see you in our upcoming session soon. Until then, Keep learning. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much, Amir. That was great. Thanks, Titi. Uh, didn't seem. Oh, okay. Anyway, we'll talk later. Team, uh, did I give enough time for the poll? We may still be live. I don't know. So there are still some attendees. We'll, we'll perhaps chat later. Bye, Dipti. Thank you.